here we go. Um, Melanie, what did you want to say about last time's Islam? Um, well, I was surprised, like in one of the outlines, it said that, you know, Islam was pro-feminist. Yes. Um, but it just, it doesn't seem like it in the Quran, Quran, um, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like it. And also they like, you know, I'm a humanist. Um, right. So they're more, you know, God-based, religion-based, which threw me off. Um, but yeah, those are my, that was my okay. reaction. Well, that is a, a huge stereotype among secular humanists, right? And I think, you know, he gives you, what he tells you is that there's reasons for the anti, the Quran can be interpreted as anti-feminist, right? And it can be interpreted as pro-feminist. All right. And the thing we talked about last time was that women got half as much as men. Mm -hmm. When until that time and everywhere else, women were just property. It right. wouldn't even occur to people that they would get anything because they weren't even human beings, you know, yeah. legally. Does that make yeah. sense? At one point, I, I read that like it was it was common, like it was OK for husbands to beat their wives. Of course. Yeah. But um, what I'm saying, what I wanted to say is. In England, 1,200 years later, women still didn't have any property rights. Yeah. So, I mean, it's way ahead of its time, right? Yeah. And it all we true. say now is that, oh, they only got half. That's terrible. That's sexist. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, come on. Get yeah, I mean, comparing it to now. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's sad. And then also the four wives thing. It depends upon how literally you want to take that, because at the time, there weren't enough men to go around. There was wars. There were they would die in war, and also they would be the ones that made themselves vulnerable in a lot of ways to get mm -hmm. food, to get war, and and parents could not provide for their daughters their whole lives, and daughters could not provide for themselves. So it made sense just in terms of survival value for them to be able to have four wives. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So there were economic reasons for it. Now, today, and I, I was in the room when two of my Indonesian colleagues got into a big fight about this. <laughs> um, so are you there, Jack? Okay. So um, I was giving a lecture about Zeus and Hera, and he cheated on her. And um, Tajul, <laughs> one of the guys said, well, Mohammed says you can have four wives, you know? And um, Nina uh, Namila was a feminist um, Muslim a prominent scholar in the feminist Muslim movement, actually. And she said, wait a sec, like you need to contextualize that. And there's no economic reason to have four wives now. And so she thinks you shouldn't, Mohammed would not want that anymore because he did treat women as equals. I mean, he treated women with dignity and respect. And so when there's no longer an economic need, there would no longer be allowing for that. Um, the other thing Mohammed said that again was unique in that time and pretty outrageously progressive was that every wife had to have her separate accommodation. She had to be able to live on her own. Again, the whole thing is she's a person, she has dignity, she has rights. And that was extremely radical at the time. Um, 
let me tell I'll tell you. I got to tell you some Indonesia stories, okay? <laughs> I was at a Hindu temple or a Hindu sort of compound in Indonesia because Indonesia is a very multi uh, faith uh, society for a lot of reasons, and I'll tell you. But I'm up there, uh, climb up at the top, and you look down, and there's a swimming pool. And this guy had a harem. All right. <laughs> All right. And I was in another uh, Muslim temple in uh, um, Turkey, the capital of Turkey. Uh, and it also, there was a, the guy had a harem, right? But in this particular harem, there was a swimming pool. And we're up on the top here looking down we're on this balcony or it's higher than a balcony and what he did there's two bedrooms and the bedroom for his wife is over here and then he points to the other woman he wants to sleep with that night and so she goes over here <laughs> oh my god so i think mohammed was a little more advanced than that is that <laughs> So this is the difference between when you read it sympathetically, like this has nothing to do with the Atman Brahman inside of us all, <laughs> right? Does that make sense how corrupted things can get? Yes. And they get normalized, right? The corruption gets normalized. And so always to me, whenever that happens, instead of judging them, I go, okay, lesson learned how completely blind and ignorant people can be if they get can, that power of habit and custom. People just grow up accepting this and they, it doesn't occur to them or they don't say anything about there's a huge gap <laughs> between the theory and what you're doing. Um, and that's why little kids, the emperor has no clothes, you know, that expression. I mean, at some point in time, that occurs to a lot of little kids that their parents are hypocrites. Uh, but they they decide, you know, kind of if they want the approval of their parents, which they desperately need. And so they'll just push it back most of the time. But anyway, so, um, so let's see. Uh, I can't remember where I was going with that. It's just that, oh yeah, I always use that to think about, okay, what are the blindnesses that I grew up with, right? It's always like lesson learned. What can that tell me about the way I think, the way I was conditioned? Because clearly there's a gap between the Sermon on the Mount and the way Americans live, right? <laughs> So I tend to use it as, well, what's analogous with, uh, we're a nation of Christians. We're not a Christian nation. Our founders did not make us a Christian nation, but we're a nation with mostly Christians. So what is it that we're blind to that's analogous to that? That's, that's how I always take it, you know? Anybody can do this. Anybody can be blind. Um, and so uh, it's always a, a learning opportunity. Um, okay, so now we're going to go to today's. Did you have any questions, Melanie, about last time's? Um, because the idea is that there's patterns, right? For every one of these religions, we did the religion in theory the attitude toward the environment and then in practice and how did how is there a gap the religion in theory what their attitude toward women should be and then in practice and how can we move forward i mean i'm giving you this so that you can move forward and um create something better right and then what about fatalism um, every religion has to decide if they're going to incorporate the religion in a way that makes people resilient and constantly striving for something better, or if it's going to make them fatalistic 
and just say it's God's will and we can't do anything, right? Every religious tradition has to deal with that question and the political leaders can manipulate people. Every, and then the fundamentalism, every religious tradition, um, kids go through this period in high school where they're alienated, they're insecure, um, they're depressed. Apparently that's a big issue right now in your generation. And somebody will come along and try to recruit them into some sort of authoritarian uh, religion or some other organization where, you know, do you think the country's going to hell or do you think nobody cares about you? Come join our group, you know, and we'll accept you and we'll save the world by getting back to traditional values or whatever it is. And so every country has to deal with that, the way religion is a powerful tool for appealing to people's need to belong. And then it can get them, you know, doing some nasty stuff in the, just to get approval of the group. All right, then there's the terrorism. And my, my argument there is that the United States, if you wanna protect your country against terrorism, you should have citizens who are self-controlled and moderate and trust each other and have goodwill toward each other. So you're internally strong. And so if you get attacked, you will have a unified reaction like Ukraine, right? They're, they were not internally divided enough. I mean, at least we don't hear about that, but even if they were, they completely came together on this one, right? So we have to have enough coherence internally so we can collectively react. And that's not what happened in the US. When 9-11 when hit, Mr. Bush tried right at that moment. And if you remember that, I had some articles way back at the beginning of the, of the class, second or third week, about right after 9-11, there was this call for unity and Mr. Bush said, no, no, we've got to, but then six months later, so Mr. Cheney and his buddies developed this, um, and the fundamentalists said, God allowed this to happen because the, the liberals are taking over our country. And so ultimately that attack divided us internally even more so that we're even less able to withstand another terrorist attack because it will polarize us even more as far as, I mean, that's my guess. And so that's what I wanted you to think about. And I also wanted you to, I gave this talk in Indonesia. So every country has to deal with this question. It's not just the US. It's just that we're the ones that can be the example to the rest of the world about what not to do, okay? We used to be the example of what to do to build a democracy. And now we are the example of what not to do to destroy whatever democracy you have <laughs> because people in the rest of the world know that we are destroying ourselves. Now you can decide what the cause of that is, or you can decide the cure is just for us to build bridges and get along, right? Which obviously I try to teach my classes to give you the language with which to build a bridge. Um, but, you know, I can't control what you do. It's just that I do want you to reflect on that. Um, okay, so this one, is about when I went to Indonesia, Indonesia has, I didn't know anything about it. I mean, really, <laughs> it's funny. You can make movies out of all the sort of crazy, silly things that happen in life. But um, I had written my proposal that I teach world, I teach Western thought and I teach it. And I was gonna teach it at this Islamic university and I wanted to talk to my Islamic 
uh, colleagues about how Islam also has a lot of the same natural law theory, just war theory, just a lot of similarities. And so that I, when I teach it in the future back in the States, I will be able to incorporate more of Islam into it because this was after 9-11. Um, uh, I don't, the way an academic career works is that you struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle and you get a tenure track position. Okay, I taught uh, for 17 years as an adjunct and then I got my tenure track position and then you struggle and struggle uh, for six years and you come up for tenure. If you get tenure, you absolutely can't lose your job unless you sleep with a student, which I'm not about to do, <laughs> or the school shuts down, which Lion is not about to do because they've got a plan. But anyway, um, so, so I came up for tenure and I sent in my files and you're not gonna believe it. The day that I sent in my files was September 10th of 2001. <laughs> and, you know, it was, I was, how old was I? 50, 49. And I had struggled for 30 years. And I went to bed at night and I had this dream that told me you've been anxious for 30 years, 25 years some certain kind of anxiety. And then I wake up and it's 9-11. So my life came together, the world fell apart. But I told myself, if I get tenure, I'm going to take my training and part of my career is gonna be integrating, you know, connecting with moderate Muslims. And it happened, you know, I just kept working on it. And eventually it happened. So um, I didn't know anything about Indonesia, but I wrote this proposal, it got accepted. And I'm reading more about Indonesia, about my colleague, what I'm supposed to teach on the plane going over there. And the like the first chapter, the second chapter said, oh, well, in 1250, Islam rejected science. So we're not going to talk about Islam. We're just going to talk about the West. And I was like, that wasn't my proposal at all. You know, like, what am I doing here? Where am I going? Um, but while I was teaching the class, I taught um, Aristotle and I taught Augustine and Aquinas. And um, let's see. Oh, John Locke and John Stuart Mill, I taught these standard great books. And every single day that I taught, Tajul, my mentor said, oh, there's something in Islam like that. And I'm going, yeah, that's what I thought. That was in my proposal. But anyway, so that was kind of crazy. Another crazy thing was um, I read their political document. It's their Declaration of Independence. And it has five main points. And I read them and I go, this is Aristotle. Um, and they didn't know that. And so I gave a lot of lectures that connected Greek culture with Indonesian culture. And they really liked it a lot because they had been taught the standard stuff. The Greeks are secularists and we're Islam. So no connection there, but you know, it's it's really sad because it takes an hour, you know, a one hour lecture and they have a completely different paradigm in their head. Um, one day I gave a lecture in Jakarta and it was to graduate students. And this one guy came down to me and he goes, I want to study with you. It's like, this is what I want to do with my life. And I, there's nothing I can do. I have no power. I can't, I don't teach graduate students. It makes me sad, <laughs> but um, to get power in the profession, you really have to split them. 
that's the only thing that gets rewarded. Oh, it's very sad. But anyway, life goes on. Um, so another thing that I find very agonizing, and um, I guess, but I guess before I start talking, I, I need to ask you, what was your reaction to the reading, Jack? From the outline, um, Whitehead says um, the essence of education is that it be religious. I disagree with that. Did you read the editorial? Yes, ma'am. The editorial from which the outline came? Mm. Did you? I mean, you know, there's oh, I didn't. just read the cheat sheet. They don't read the original editorial, which was another attachment. Did you? I read didn't read the. Well, I didn't read the attachment for that one. Okay. But I mean, it would help, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think it meant what I mean by spiritual humanism, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think it meant uh, in a traditional way. I oh. think it just meant the Greeks, right? That's why, again, the people in Indonesia really liked my work. And actually, Mr. Buby is Whiteheadian which is why he and I taught together for 17 years and we just got along so well because his classes are a little different because he thinks differently just in the methodology, but ultimately we had the same goal and it was really wonderful. That, uh, that is rare. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, you should read the editorial and then see, you know, See for yourself and you can write in your post what sort of distinction you want to make. Okay. Mm. Uh, what else? Anything else? Um, I, I didn't realize um, Islam was so prevalent in um, Indonesia. Actually, it's 88%. It's more moderate Muslims than in the whole Mideast. I didn't know this. Like, we should know this, right? Um, it, so it has 12% of the people are either Protestant or Catholic or Hindu or Buddhist or Confucian. And then about 12% of the Muslims are extremists. The thing is about 12% of American Christians are extremists, right? So I think every country has probably about the same percent of extremists. So that was very eye-opening for me. And then also, I, I developed a real sense of mission, right? It's really important that moderate Islam prevail in Indonesia because of how many people there. It's the fourth largest country in the world. Um, so anyway, I'm actually trying to arrange with the guy from Indonesia to go teach there some more as I phase off my retirement, so. Um, good. Are you glad you found out? Yeah, that's pretty cool. It just creates this different model in your head of what the world is like. Mm. Okay, good. Anything else, Jack? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, Melanie, do you have something? Um, yeah, I found myself comparing, um, comparing it to Christianity a lot. Like just um, how, you know, there's Muhammad, there's a God figure, um, you pray to him. Also, there was such thing as a perfect person. And I compared that to, you know, a saved person in Christianity. Right. So, I don't know. It just reminded me a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. Compared to Confucianism, Hinduism, or Buddhism that are more mystical, right? Right. So there's the religions of the book, and then there's the mystical religions. And mm -hmm. so that would be a difference. And then there's these other character traits would be a similarity. Um, so I personally prefer the non-book. <laughs> it's so easy to look at black marks on white paper, mm -hmm. use them to justify stuff. Does that make, I mean, I think you agree with that, Melanie, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's just a real fallback 
easy schmeasy lazy baby thing yeah. you can do with it's the fear of the unknown they're putting their fear into something i remember i had a student once and he said you know it's kind of strange like i don't know how to subjugate a how to um work out a french verb but i know the whole meaning of life and our future <laughs> it's like hey buddy maybe you don't know you know <laughs> <laughs> oh my god these people they think they know what they don't know and you can't have a democracy if you expect other people if you try to run the country based on you know claiming to know something that is unknowable then you can't have a democracy like when you're acting as a citizen, you must act on the basis of something that everybody can know and that's knowable and that requires evidence. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, it makes sense to you, Jack, doesn't it? Yeah, yes, that's why. Okay, what about you, Mia? Um, My comment was more towards the article well, like towards the end of the article talking about like our, it was like, I think it was titled like the part was like our Americans like stingy or whatever, something, something okay. about how I, I don't know. I didn't realize like countries or like places that are like a lot less, not necessarily a lot less fortunate, but I mean, I feel like, well, maybe not a lot less fortunate, but I just feel like, like I always kind of view America as like the top, but again, I am an American. So I, I feel like that's probably just my personal bias and I'm trying to learn around that. But like we donated like what it was like 15 cents or something for every like hundred dollars or whatever, which is ridiculous. Like I know that over time America, America has accumulated a lot of debt, but like we can do more than that. We can definitely do more than that. Um, and then my other comment just about Islam in general was, uh, I think it's something I think I don't remember if Jack or Melanie said it, but it was like I didn't realize that you know Indonesia w had such a high like Muslim or like population of people that you know kind of followed that. So that was pretty much my those were my main. They have two hundred and twenty million Muslims. That's a oh lot. my, that is a lot. Um, yeah. Okay. So Mia. You could check out that rough estimate in the terrorism article of how much money per person people pay to federal taxes for and what they get. 2200 for military. I think the thing says 2000 but I think it's up to about 2300 per person, right? If you have four people in your family, that's like $9,000 just for military. And then it's $30 for diplomacy, you know? Oh Ooh. boy. But it always works. Why do we have it that way? Look at the politicians. Ah, oh, we got to have, oh, we got these enemies. Oh, you know, and nobody looks to see. Well, I, you know, I gave you 2200. You just see what you can do with it, you know? Does that make sense, Mia? Yes, ma'am. And how much do we give to the humanities to try and? take kids from the ghetto to visit the symphony and visit the um, theater and go to an art museum, get engaged with public life. We care about you. We want you to succeed. You can go to a play. You can do this stuff, even take them to a sports event. But I mean, the humanities would be taking them, having somebody come in. I knew a woman who did puppets and the National Endowment would pay for her to go visit the schools. I mean, all this stuff. How much do we give to that? 80 cents. Okay. Yeah, Less than a dollar. Mm. How much do we give to the arts so that artists can start to create something that's not driven by corporate money? They don't have to kiss up to anybody, right? The government can, that's the one thing. It's an opportunity to create something artistic without having to kiss up and how much money do we give to them? 40 cents. <laughs> and lots of them, if they're successful, 
they start making money and they pay taxes, right? So that 40 cents definitely comes back as more than 40 cents. It's a great investment. And, you know, the thing is, all of you in high school could have gotten a couple weeks of lectures that just would have completely altered your worldview. At common sense, you wouldn't even think it was political, right? Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. It's just kind of sad. Well, it's very sad. But anyway, um, here's another here's another sad, agonizing thing. Is that as a matter of fact, um, the U.S has more institutions teaching public policy and environmental engineering, all this stuff that people in developing countries, they're dying to get into America, dying to study this stuff so they can go back home. And Americans don't even want an education, right? And Americans don't care about public policy and they don't vote on the basis of public policy. And it's just so ironic um, that we have so much. And not only do we not take it for granted, we don't even use it. And not only do we not use it, we trash it, right? Oh my gosh, it's just sad. So here's the Ponchicilla. And um, this belief in God uh, is a very Aristotelian idea of God because it's generic. It applies to Islam, Confucius, Buddhism, um, uh, Christianity, Protestantism, Catholicism. Um, anyway, it's an inner faith view. It's very generic. And so if you're going to be Indonesian, to think like Aristotle, you, you almost need to in order to be a good citizen. And so I told them that and it made sense to them. Um, and they also focused on Aristotle included political life is really important. So the US has a minimum government interference. You know, government is for uh, military and police and that's it. Obviously, if you look at the way we spend money. But in this other, in developing countries, the government is more engaged with helping lift up the poor. And they are in theory, like they have a different theory of the place of political life in cultural life. Um, okay, so then the, excuse me, the other thing was that they talk about wisdom through deliberation and that's very Greek, right? How do you develop wisdom when you talk to each other and the gods and goddesses talk to each other and the people in Homer and Hesiod are talking to each other and Socrates is talking to Euthyphro and all those guys, right? That's how you get to wisdom. So they value wisdom, not just knowledge and you get it through deliberation, not through some principles, abstract principles. Okay. So public policy programs. Um, the, actually, the US founders, when they're developing our constitution, the collective mind was we're engaged in the science of government because it was the enlightenment. For the first time in history, they were gonna put together, they were starting from scratch, right? It was amazing. Um, and, I, and again, how many, American students learn this in, call, in high school, grade school, whatever. Um, so if that's true, if the foundation is the science of government, in order to pr promote and carry on our political tradition, you would want education in public policy and governance, right? That's completely what our founding fathers wanted. So every generation would figure out the science of government to address the problems of their day. Okay, and so another thing uh, we've talked about is this old paradigm of individuality and the new paradigm of people working together, right? Um, working with nonprofits, 
private sectors, private donors. And this is the way it works. Like the, we have the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. We have all sorts of the Gates Foundation. We have all those private foundations. Then we have governments and they all work together. There's no, there's no anti-government or anti-capitalism. It's just a combination of things. Um, so the students, these are students applying for grad school. And that was his, his argument. And some of the, I think they were about half women and half men because the Indonesians really work on women's equality. A lot of the deans, a lot of the administrators that I met were women and the men were the teachers. So that was, that was interesting. Um, so this guy wants to be an auditor. Um, he, again, all these classes in government, public policy, budgeting. Uh, the third one is to clean up the corruption. Um, so we wanted to get an education in um, good governance, and then you can expose the corruption and also figure out how to move forward. What do you want to structure to prevent future corruption, but also to have an efficient government? Uh, he wanted to go home and have reform, changing the mindset and the culture set. So in developing countries, a lot of times people give jobs to their family. Um, and for example, in India, I remember reading that people come from the countryside and move into Calcutta and the conditions are horrible, but they do it because there's one kid who comes, who they bring along to go to school. And like the whole family is sacrificing so this kid can go to school and get a good job. Well, <laughs> once he gets the good job, you know, it's payback time. So there is a lot of nepotism, right? Giving the jobs, uh, whatever power you have, using it to promote your family's welfare. So, but if that's true, if the family has sacrificed everything for you, it's pretty hard to break that chain. All right, so then you have the problem of incompetence. You have, you know, lots of problems. It's just that that's what they want. Like they know the problems. They come to America to get a good education for how to spot it, how to replace it, set up something different. Um, Anti-corruption law. Um, a holistic national strategy. Um, they look to the United Nations. The United Nations is much more respected. The US is the outlier. It tends to respect the UN less. And, and we were the ones who founded it after World War II. It was based on our, you know, the notion of human rights. And so the US was the leader in democracy in the 1945 when it was founded after World War II. And now we're the outlier, like we're the ones that defy it whenever there's any military conflict. But the UN has a lot more, it does a lot more than military and Americans don't know that either. For example, when I was in Indonesia, there was a woman there who got a grant because she wanted to be a nursing administrator for a nursing program because the United Nations has a standardized set of class requirements and curricula so that every nurse in a developing country has had this education, which I think is a really good idea because the countries are developing and they shouldn't have to create the wheel, right? And then this woman came and she educated them, she administered it, she set up the whole system, which I think was a great idea. And so as a philosopher, that's, I think in terms of systems. And so most people think about the boots on the ground, how this person is treating this person, blah, blah. But if you just stand back and you say, and you look at, look, people can't be effective unless Somebody has thought about this stuff in the big picture and they've developed a system and then they go out and recruit people to 
Well, they have to, somebody has to have the education to create a good system. Then they have to know how to recruit people to run the system. Then they have to, part of that is hiring good people. So you really need to sit back and get the big picture. And that's what public administration, public policy, good governance, that's what those programs are. But Americans are very anti-intellectual. And that includes the intellectual side of political life, setting up a decent system, institution. Our founding fathers were obsessed about setting up a good system. And, um, but every generation has to keep tweaking it or adding new, like our healthcare system is a whole new system, but it has been structured and driven by greed not by the desire to maximize basic health in as many people as possible. That is not the goal. The goal is making money and we're not doing a very good job. We're, our healthcare costs three times more than the average in Europe and we don't live any longer. <laughs> and we don't go to the doctors often because people have to pay. So to pay three times more per person and get no, nothing better. That's what happens when you have greed driving the system. Anyway, so this is another example of um, coming to study overall systems and going home and, and uh, implementing them. Uh, global media communication, uh, synergistic means getting the networks to work together. Uh, international affairs, international developments, something else that we've, we, I mean, Indonesia is on board with climate change because they have literally, they have to evacuate people off of some of their islands because of the rising sea. <laughs> and they, and I mean, they, developing countries are experiencing the worst effects of climate change. And so politicians in those countries always say they're in favor of it. Now they don't always have the power to do much about it because if some European American or Chinese corporation comes in there and says, look, if you let me uh, tear up your land and find some minerals, copper or whatever, I'll, I'll provide jobs and the politician cannot say no to jobs. And so even though they understand climate change, even though they want to be, go green, they just, they're not in control. They can't say no. And the Chinese now are doing this uh, roads and you know they're building all these roads and infrastructure and ports and all this stuff, because they've got, I mean, they're imperialists, right? They want to control the world, uh, which we have want. We set that up. So they're just taking over and we're gonna have a lot of animosity with them. But um, you do need to know that these countries like Indonesia get caught in the middle of it. Um, in the last 40 years, Indonesia has lost no, in the last 20 years, think of this, they've lost 40% of their forests in 20 years. Like that is unsustainable, right? Something has absolutely got to give. Um, solar power, so they're trying to move toward green energy, construction management. Um, all right, I just want to, I, when I read those proposals, I just wanted to write an outline to just give you this idea, again, of what's going on all over the world, of what the US was supposed to be the leader in teaching people about public policy, good institutions, good governance, and send them back to their countries. But that is not the reputation we have. It's just that to some extent, it keeps going on, but I sure wish that um, our media or whatever it is would 
that Americans were just aware of this before we lose it altogether. Um, all right, so this, the um, Jakarta Post, let's see, here we go. So the Jakarta Post had these articles about holistic education um, for human values. And then you could just lop off the religion part and just you know think of it as humanism, physical, spiritual, and by spiritual, I would I would plug in the Greek uh, natural spiritual humanism, uh, and that's what I used to do when I talked there. That that the arts are really important. That it can't be just math and science. You have to work on character and the arts and all this other stuff. Um, let's see. So then the next one was about religious conflict, and I. I included this because he relates it to social class and the lower classes are being marginalized by modernization. And that's happening in the US. The people who, um, who used to have union jobs, their grandfathers had these great jobs and now they're out of luck and they're downwardly mobile and they're afraid and they turn to religion. Uh, religious conflict and um, how are you going to deal with religion? So I wanted you to be able to see that there's analogies there with the problems that they have and the problems that we have. Um, they're not identical because we're a wealthier country, but we're not fundamentally different. We have the same humanity. Then there's an article about Muhammad as a protector of minority rights. And he uses, he has a lot of quotes and a lot of footnotes at the end of his article. Um, mostly the Jakarta Post is the, the number one newspaper and it's in English. I think it's the only one in English, but the editorials in that paper were so much better than any newspaper I know of in the US. Much better than the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, um, I actually, I, I only followed the times I didn't follow the Washington Post, but really they were really good. They were, I don't know, they tried to bind the country together. They didn't polarize. Um, anyway, so the other thing, okay, so this is my, my main lecture was about the democracy there, but let me, well, okay, and then I'll do the tsunami one. And then we'll look at pretty pictures at the end, I hope. Um, oh dear. Oh my gosh, I hope. I hope this works. It worked before. Oh my gosh. Um, that's not what I want. Oh dear. Uh, Google Slides, is this going to work? Yes, okay, good. Um, okay, do you guys know how I could get it full screen? Which button to punch to get the full screen? Anybody know? I don't see. I don't see it. I usually see it. Okay. Um, oh, a slideshow. Maybe that's it. Okay, good. All right. Is everybody there? Are people in the class? I can't. Yes, okay. Yes, All right. So here we go. Okay. Indonesia. Here it is. Um, in theory, it has 1,700 islands or something. And the joke that I have here is I'm from Minnesota, okay? And the joke in Minnesota is that it has 10,000 lakes if it rains, <laughs> because some of those lakes are pretty small. So when it rains, it has 10,000 lakes. So in Indonesia, it has 17,000 islands when it doesn't rain, right? 
So climate change is probably going to wipe out a couple hundred of those islands. But anyway, it's a very huge country. It's a bunch of islands. It's very diverse. And it's got a lot more diversity than the US. So we need to get over ourselves, guys. Um, because we're not, we used to be the world's leader in pluralism and diversity and open mindedness. That is, I'm sorry, you know, it's not true. India, Indonesia, they have as much or more diversity and they deal with these issues. Um, all right. So when I went there, I was teaching Western thought at an Islamic State University. And my mentor, Tajul, has his niece, Ranti, and her husband is, uh, works on an oil rig, an Exxon oil ship. So he's gone most of the year. So he rented a house for me. And um, Ranti lived there with me and she cooked for me. She cleaned for me. She washed my clothes. And one time she was ironing my underwear. And I said, you don't have to iron my underwear. And then every night she gave me a foot massage. And I'm telling you, I really miss those foot massages. They were great. But anyway, so we went to her village. That was, I got a really great experience. I got to live in an area of the city where there weren't any other Americans or English or foreigners, you know, I was the only foreign. It was a real neighborhood. And then we got to go to her village where she grew up. And it's basically off the road. You have to go on this thing that is not really a road. It's two concrete slabs, you know, <laughs> with uh, land between them leading into the village. And so there's Ranti. Now, this is her grandmother raised her because her mother died when she was little. And then when her dad remarried, he didn't want her around. She didn't want her around. So she was sent to her grandma. Now her grandma is going to sit at the home, at the home of her aunt and die, right? And it's just for you to think about, these are poor people who can't go to the hospital and get plugged into all this stuff and sp spend millions of bucks that they they pass down as debt to their grandkids right and so i do think we ought to rethink what our goal is in terms of um a well-lived life and a happy death right her aunt is just going to take care of her grandma until she lies down and dies is that so bad right um Okay, so here's Tajul and me, and um, that's the name of the school. And here's their declaration, the belief in God, but it, it's very inclusive, uh, civilized humanity. So political life plays an important role, like it does in the Greeks. Um, uniting people, which means put um, uniting people who from different religions and ethnicity, and using wisdom and um, distributing goods. Justice would be distributing the wealth and education and healthcare equally between all the different people. The political context, they became independent. Um, after we bombed Japan, Japan left Indonesia. And um, they had Sukarno was like their George Washington and then Suharto was the guy he appointed to be the military leader and he took over. <laughs> um, you know, so that's kind of a story there. But my main point to my, um, to my students at that point was it wasn't really until about the year 2000 that they actually had elections, um, that different people ran for election and it wasn't a fake election, okay? Um, so my students, that would be 12 years after it actually started to be uh, free elections. And they were very discouraged about corruption because it was getting reported 
that if you belong to a certain family, the judge would sort of let you off and all this other stuff. But I just told them, wait a sec, you've only had democracy for 12 years. Don't get too discouraged, right? Your generation is the first group of young people. They're going to go out there and expect to have a free election, a legitimate election, right? So um, I told them, first of all, you have laws, right? It is against the law to do stuff. Second of all, you have journalists reporting that these people are breaking the law, right? And then you have that they do get some kind of punishment. Those are democracy. Those are characteristics of democracy, of transparency, you have accountability, and you have laws that require political leaders, those with power, to be transparent and to be accountable. And you have a free press. So I try, you know, I just tried to tell them, come on, guys, don't obsess about the corruption, just focus on what you've got. And at two extremes, they had they had the communists who tried to take over. They were one extreme, and then the Islamists, the other extreme. So most of them were committed to moderation, to religious pluralism, and to democracy because they understood the threats from the two extremes. Uh, but they might be losing that memory. You know, they can lose it. Every generation has to re remember, you know, we don't want extremism. We don't want that. You forget, sort of sounds good. No. Um, and I taught them all about Western thought. And Tajul said, gee, there's something like that in Islam. So yeah, I taught them about the virtues. It all made sense to them, right? No problem. Common language, all those virtues. I taught them about the deities. Okay, so it's they pray. And um, when we were traveling, uh, Mohammed had said that if you're traveling, you can collapse two prayers together when you get home. You know, you don't have to actually do it at that time of day, but there's a certain prayer for each time of day. And on the right hand side there, right before I left, it was Ramadan. So that's uh, where they fast during the day. And these kids that were like a junior high were not drinking anything or eating all day. And it's just, wow, I admired them, but <laughs> I didn't do it. Oh my God. They were a lot more self-controlled than I, than I was. I just didn't want to think about being thirsty and hungry all day. And I would have. They just had a lot of self-discipline. Um, this is uh, joked out some of the places that I taught. And the guy who uh, uh, asked me to speak here a number of times, I was talking to him today, this morning, because I'm hoping to be able to go back there. There's the civics class. Um, so I was teaching them about democracy, about Athenian democracy, and again, using all these analogies about what they had and how they corrupted it and they lost it, they understood all that. It was no problem for them to understand that. Um, but I also told them, you know, nonviolent, I told them about all my demonstrations, nonviolent demonstrations I had participated in, civil rights movement, anti war movement, environmental movement anti-Iraq war movement, uh, all this stuff year after year, human rights movement, women's rights movement, gay rights movement, um, just to tell them, you know, you, if you're in a democracy and you don't like what they do, you should non-violently get out in the street and let somebody know that th this is not okay with you. Um, okay, and there's another, Thing, and here's the, it was the woman who was the administrator, um, the responsibility of citizens. So I, again, I talked there, why should anybody get a degree? What's the purpose today? Uh, oh, this is where I lived. And so my bedroom was there. Ronti's bedroom was there. 
uh, the kitchen was there, but it had this beautiful um, kind of like a garden patio uh, over at the end of it, right behind where the camera is. But this is my class. I invited my class to come over and they were so amazed that I would invite them over because in, in general, people with PhDs are like part of the aristocratic class and they separate themselves. But I was just really kind of like Uncle Jed. <laughs> That's the way Americans in general, they're rich, but they're just kind of like hicks, you know, they don't have that many affectations. And that was, you know, I wanted to make myself pretty accessible and help them just let them know, you know, I'm just a person, I'm a mom, I talk about my kids and all that stuff. Um, but it was, that was really fun. Um, American Indonesia, I just told them, come, but don't try to be America, like, be yourself, be your own nation and make it good. Don't just try to be like us. We have plenty of our own problems. Um, okay, wisdom, uh, practical wisdom, right? Taught about that. I taught about integrating science and religion. Um, let's see, developing a new paradigm for how to, for a global culture. I did a lot of that. And there we are again, let's see. Lessons from Greece and the USA, they really liked all that stuff. So the institutions need to develop to maintain democracy, right? It's very holistic. Kids have to learn habits at home, social life, political life, formal and informal education. Um, this was about uh, Greek tragedy and about using rhetoric to either educate people or manipulate people. Um, and they understood that. Um, this one is about this. I went to a high school, uh, an Islamic high school. It was so amazing. Like I, when I arrived there, it was, in a, it was in a very rural place. And these kids were poor and they came to the high school and they were farmers. They had farmland, they made honey, they had animals. They did all this stuff to help pay for themselves to be a self-sustaining uh, operation. But when I came, I got out of my car and oh my God, it was like I was a diplomat or an ambassador or something. And I had my translator and I had Rati with me. And I was all, it was just, and they, the kids were, they did these special dances from their native culture and I don't know, I just started crying. I could not imagine. I mean, I had had a kid in the ghetto of Philadelphia. I had no idea where my life was going for a long time. And all of a sudden here I am, it was just amazing. Um, here's where I talked about terrorism. Um, and then, okay, so in the morning I gave my talk about the virtues and then at lunchtime, these people with these white outfits drove up in a van and I was eating with my colleagues and they just go, oh my God, these people are here. And I was wondering what's going on. And, and these people were intolerant and they came to this, uh, they're basically spies, right? They're coming to see what sort of awful stuff the liberals are promoting in order to report back to their organization. Um, and this guy in particular came and gave a talk and he says, well, actually Mohammed is obviously the only person to, to be a role model because look at what he does. He has all this self-control and he, he handles his anger. And I thought, buddy, if you'd been at my talk in the morning, you'd know how stupid this is. But anyway, so after he was done, I had all these questions for him. I was really mad, right? He's talking about why they should be intolerant. And Indonesia cannot, this is antithetical. There would be so many civil wars in Indonesia if, if this were allowed to stand. So I just hammered this guy. And I remember everybody in the audience was going, Yay, 
Professor Beck, go for it, you know, <laughs> go for it, you know, it was, they were just plugging for me. And then after it was over, that guy came up to me, he grew up in Southern California. He was an arrogant American who had just totally converted to extreme Islam. And now he was undermining Indonesian stability and culture. And I just thought, oh my God, but I was happy to be there. Like somebody has got to call this guy out, you know? But again, I could understand why they liked my Greek stuff because it was an answer to all of this. Then I had one where the night before the talk, he tells me, oh, this is what I want you to talk about. I was like, okay, whatever. Um, and they couldn't pay me money, but they gave me batik. I really like textiles. Um, each country has its own sort of specialty. And in Indonesia, it's batik. And I'm not wearing one right now, but I, I have a lot of them. But each area has its own colors and its own styles that sort of fit the geology, the geography. Like one of the areas has a certain pattern in their batik that looks like the clouds, the way the clouds form in that area. And I remember uh, looking at the clouds in that area and going, wow, that looks just like my dress. Um, but I, I just think that's wonderful. I love that stuff because you're tying your sensuality, like your appreciation for style and color and shape and texture, feeling. You're tying that into your spiritual life, your, you know, cultured life, your social life, your political life. You're bonding with other people in a way that isn't adversarial. It's not my batik, you know, nobody's going to go to war over whose batik is better, right? It's just a way to bond people, a common humanity and a common sensuality and uh, to make us truly civilized people. Um, okay. Well, let's see. There's education, uh, how to end corruption. That was the outline I gave you as a talk here. Oh, here's the funny stuff. Okay, there I was, we were driving and I saw this sign that said Marta Bach. And I was like, what? <laughs> it's like you go to France and there's kind of a kind of food called Amilet, you know? <laughs> and my name would be Amilet. I mean, it was just like that. Like that's my name. And then they had sweet Marta Bach and they had, uh, you know, meet Mart Martabak, but this one was uh, Mickey Mouse, uh, Donald Duck Martabak. So <laughs> I thought that was funny. All right, and here is um, trying to sit cross-legged, which they're really good at and I'm really terrible at. And then there was, I got my Hindu sword at the place, the high school where I gave a lecture. And that was funny because all the local dignitaries came and they all start talking and like there was no time for me to talk. <laughs> it was like an hour and a half or two hours and Tajwal said, I think you better cut your talk short. And already I had to cut it in half so he could translate. So I told Tajwal, no, I'm not cutting it short. I'm sorry. Like the whole point was supposed to be me. It's the mayor and it's uh, all these other guys. Um, and then they, they have spices and they eat with their fingers. And the first time I had to eat with my fingers, I was sitting with these really, these dignitaries, these big guys, and I just spilled all over. And when I stood up, it's like, <laughs> it fell all out of my lap. But I actually got better at it. And by the end, uh, when I even had a chance to use silverware, I thought, no way, I'm just gonna you know, do this before it's over. So you take a little bit of rice and you take a little bit of fish or, and vegetable and then some spices, and then you put it in your mouth. It's like you have a whole dish right there and you get to you know, choose exactly you know, how you want it to be balanced. It was really good food, really healthy food too. And this is um, 
uh, going fishing. And another thing is bamboo. Like bamboo for them is like duct tape for us. You use it for everything. So you use bamboo to make the bridge. You use bamboo to fix the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> and you can build a three-story house with bamboo. And you can also have soup, um, coconut milk soup, bamboo shoots in it was my favorite. Uh, this is where all the women get together on Saturday morning with their babies. And they have this little chat time, which everybody in the world does that. And they all, they, all they want is a stable middle class, right? They just want uh, economic security. They don't want to get rich, but they want to be stable. And I think we all basically want the same things. Um, the Dutch came and they, they, they were the predominant colonizers and they broke their treaties three different times. I don't have time to go into that, but it's pretty annoying. Then there was the wedding that I went to. I went to a village wedding again. Wow, I had such a great time. And it was, it, you know, we got there and we walked all the way through the town with our gifts, right? So people are carrying their gifts and walking through the village. We get to this place. There's like a performance platform, a stage. And we're sitting there. It was just quite a long wait. And you see these two girls who clearly their parents moved from the country to the city. And they were spoiled brat, rich girls, 15, you know, the ultimate junior high yucky girls gossiping. I don't want to be here, you know, this is hick country. <laughs> anyway, so we wait, wait. And then Tajul said, uh, it's time for time to eat. And I said, you eat before the wedding? And he said, no, no, we already had the wedding. It was in the tent because only men could be there. <laughs> so, okay, whatever. And then um, I don't eat meat and a lot of stuff was meat, but I want, you know, the people to think, you know, so I saw a green bean salad and I just piled my plate with green bean salad. Well, I took a big bite of green bean salad. It turns out it was hot peppers. <laughs> and so, and Ronti knew, like she looked at me and she knew, oh my God, she just put a whole, you know, mouthful of hot peppers in her mouth. So she got me a, an orange and a banana and she's beating some water. <laughs> That was kind of funny. Um, these are puppets. And these are sort of like the fool in a Shakespeare play. They're the one that tells the truth, right? And uh, everybody else is trying to have the veneer of culture. And the puppet is the one that, you know, speaks out. So here's the batik um, that I, and this is the great pluralistic society, right? So they had a Hindu temple and then a uh, Muslim um, uh, mosque was built inside the Hindu temple. And then the question is, can they maintain it, right? Can they avoid falling into extremism and authoritarianism? And of course, in 2012, I was just thinking, you know, I really want it to work. It's really important for the US that it works. There's all these threats and the US, and I told them the US has threats too. Um, takeover by the rich is our biggest threat. And so it was, let's all hope that they can do it. But I mean, the truth is our country is also hanging on the brink. We can lose our democracy too. We would lose it to the rich rather than to a military because our military is controlled by the rich. So. That's my presentation. Um, what time is it? Oh my gosh. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Anything surprising? Yeah, well, you can go, but if anybody wants to stay and talk to me, I obviously had a great time. Oops. <laughs> 